This is the City of God podcast, where Christ meets culture. Welcome to the City of God podcast, where we are weekly discussing today's biggest cultural issues all through the lens of God's infallible word. I'm Rob Pacienza, and as always, joined by my co-host, John. John, good to see you today. It's good to see you as well, Rob, as always. Uh, how many programs would you say that we've done? I don't know the number, 15, 20? Yeah, uh, yeah at least. At least, maybe more than that. I, I sort of lose track. It's like with, with life and in years, I've learned I've have to double everything. If I think sure. it was 10 years ago, it was 20 years ago. But I think today is perhaps in the, the short life of this program going to be the most poignant mm. program that we've done uh, for reasons that will become very apparent here as we, as we get moving forward. Yeah, John, just to a, a few weeks ago, we had the privilege of sitting down with uh, Dr. Harry Reeder, uh, who at the time was the senior pastor of Briarwood Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama, founding church of the Presbyterian Church in America. And uh, it was just a couple weeks later uh, that we all received the news on that uh, Thursday uh, morning uh, that uh, he tragically was in a car accident. It was a fatal accident, and he is now uh, standing before uh, the face of God uh, mm -hmm. in in heaven. But uh, it uh, was a shock to all of us uh, in our denomination and the broader evangelical community that uh, loved him and knew him, but uh, a real shock uh, to our staff, both at uh, this media ministry and uh, to our church that uh, not only loved him and knew him well, but as uh, you mentioned, uh, he was just uh, here. And uh, we had the opportunity to sit down with him and interview him while he was at our uh, Kingdom Come conference. Yeah, he was at the, the Kingdom Come conference where we had so many excellent speakers and guests who we've featured on this uh, on this podcast. But uh, I, I had that that reaction, that odd reaction that we all tend to have in such situations because, you know, you and I are sitting here right now. It was even now, it was just a few weeks ago, Harry Reader is sitting right here to, to my right. And and then he's gone. Yeah. And uh, of course, God is sovereign over that. And Harry Reader would have been the first one to tell you that, that, that God has determined the number of our days and he knows the end from the beginning. And, and this was all ordained and, uh, by God and, and nothing is outside of his plan, outside of his sovereignty. But from a human perspective, I, my first thought was, well, that's impossible. He, I just saw him. He was right. fine. I know. And I know. Th that's that's the way that things are, though. None of us knows the number of days that God has ordained for us, and that's why we live yeah, you're each one of them. Reminded in the of the brevity of, of life. Uh, mm -hmm. you're, 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 in times like this, you're, you're reminded of making every moment here on earth uh, count for the glory of God and the kingdom of God. And I think the that is the testimony of Harry Reader's life. He made every moment count in, in many ways. Um, I said this just a few months ago. I know some of my other colleagues have mentioned this as well. I, I felt like his preaching was actually getting better. Mm. Um, he was a phenomenal preacher his whole career, but I mean, he had uh, uh, just as much fire uh, today, uh, now currently uh, that he did 10, 20 years ago. And uh, he was a man that till his uh, last uh, breath, uh, was doing everything to pour out himself for the sake of the gospel and the advancement of the kingdom. Uh, he was not only the senior pastor of Briarwood Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, he was uh, part of the executive council for the Gospel Reformation Network, which is committed to uh, biblically faithful churches in the PCA. Uh, he was the co-host of Today in Perspective, uh, which is uh, similar uh, to uh, our programming, exploring uh, the issues of the day from a biblical worldview. But uh, for me personally, he was he was my pastor and mentor, uh, in addition to D. James Kennedy being my childhood pastor, Harry Reeder was my pastor throughout college and became a pastor, mentor, father figure uh, to me uh, as I continued to grow and mature in the faith, uh, as I went through ordination, as I uh, developed my calling, uh, as I entered into the uh, senior uh, calling to be senior pastor here at Coral Ridge. Uh, he was one of the uh, chief individuals in my ear, encouraging me, mentoring me, continuing to uh, pour his life into to me, as I know he did for uh, so many others um, at his funeral, which you can see online if you go to the Briarwood website, uh, the, uh, one of the ministers who spoke called him an oak. 
mm. uh, that the great oak has fallen. Yeah. And uh, I think everybody that knew him well, particularly the young pastors in our denomination, uh, are feeling that uh, the oak has fallen. It's like dad has been taken home. Mm. Uh, there was the sense if you knew Harry Reader was fighting for uh, a particular position, if you knew he was on the front lines, it's, uh, you know, dad's there, you know, the, uh, you know, things are going to be okay. Uh, and so there's that sense of dad's been taken home. Uh, the, the, one of the great fathers, uh, not only of our denomination, but the fathers of our faith has been taken home. And uh, that, uh, that, that's uh, been quite surreal uh, for so many of us younger pastors uh, in not only the PCA, but in evangelicalism. And that's what makes this program so poignant is because we are going to have the opportunity now to hear from Dr. Harry Reeder and not to be too dramatic about it, but publicly uh, some of his final words. Uh, you know, he this was recorded, uh, I think, maybe six weeks before his death. And uh, he, he touches on so many of the things that are, are big in our culture right now and does it fearlessly and with uh, just great incisiveness and humor and you know you you have a personal loss here I my first time meeting him was when we recorded this podcast that we're about to play um, but just uh, really enjoyed and I'm grateful for the chance to have gotten to meet him and to talk to him and it was just immediately apparent you sit and talk to this guy and you say, this is somebody to listen to. This guy gets it. This guy not only gets it, but knows how to communicate it and is doing this effectively. And and in this conversation, we talk about what it means to be a pastor today in this world Absolutely. and 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 his continuing on in that calling, as you said, even getting stronger late in life. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and, and God had a, a, a plan for him to really, as as we say in the sports world, leave it all out on the field. And, and Dr. Harris reader did that. So it's, it's really profound to get to hear some of his final public comments yeah. in this podcast. We'll talk about boldness in the pulpit. We'll talk about persecution in America. We'll, we'll talk about a biblical worldview of gender and sexuality. And ultimately, uh, which I know was uh, near and dear to his heart, uh, making sure that we always uphold the power and sufficiency of the gospel. If there is one thing that um, Harry Reader will be remembered for is preaching the gospel uh, in all of its fullness, the whole counsel of God. Uh, how it impacts and transforms individuals, societies, nations, and cultures. Uh, and really his life, I pray, will uh, be a shining example for the next generation of pastors and Christians yes. everywhere of remembering the, the precious gospel that does not belong to us, but has been entrusted to us uh, as the only hope for a fallen world. Let me just say this before just on a, a personal level, uh, just on um, behalf of our media ministry, uh, our church, uh, just our condolences to Cindy Reader, uh, to the entire Reader family and our brothers and sisters at Briarwood Presbyterian Church. Um, uh, if this podcast reaches any one of those individuals, please know that uh, you have brothers and sisters here in South Florida that love you, are praying for you, uh, and will do everything possible to keep the legacy of Harry Lloyd Reader III alive and well. And uh, with that, John, uh, let's check out our interview uh, with the late Dr. Harry Reader. Harry, you wrote a book, Embers of Flame, which emphasizes the importance of church revitalization. Explain to us a little bit about that book and why you've dedicated so much of your time and energy to talking about the importance of church revitalization. Yeah, so Rob, uh, when I first came into the ministry, it wasn't too far from right here. Uh, it was down in South Miami. Ah. The church was Pinelands Presbyterian, Perrine Cutler Ridge. Uh, actually, the Presbyterian was go going to close it, or wanted to close it, sell the property, take the money, and go plant another church. My only problem was, is I'd looked around and saw all those people, and so I just asked them, they asked me to come, and I asked them, give us six months, and let's see what happens. And... Um, so, you know, I was educated uh, at uh, Westminster Seminary with a obviously high view of the Scripture and the sufficiency of Scripture. But I knew it was sufficient, but, you know, what, do, what about, what do you do with a dying church? Hmm. And um, I just got into the Word of God and saw that uh, Paul on his second missionary journey went back to strengthen the churches. 
And I realized at that time there was a plethora of material called church growth. And while I felt church growth was a consequence, it was not the objective. Uh, if, you, if it became the objective, you would begin, because mission always controls message. So if, if my mission is church growth, I could see where you then move into a pragmatic gospel, just to put the, you know, the, uh, fill up the seats. And, um, and so what was the objective? And I went back and saw what Paul did. Then Paul sent Timothy on a ministry of church revitalization to Ephesus after his first Roman imprisonment. And then he gives John direction on another revitalization 50 years later of the church at Ephesus. And I began to realize that actually the objective is not church growth. The objective is church health. And I... Uh, furthermore, just I mean, this is what eureka moment. So the pastorate I began to see was, um, I call it the lampstand church. You, uh, church planting, ignite the flame, church revitalization, the embers to a flame, and church acceleration, nurturing the flame. Wow. And so um, I was not in a church plant. I was in a church revitalization. And so what do you do? And uh, Jesus tells you right there in, in uh, Revelation chapter 2, remember, repent, and recover the first things. So I said to Pinelands, remember, let's learn from the past, not to live in it, but let's learn from it. Let's repent of the sin that is in the camp, and then let's recover the first things. Mm. And that became the whole strategy. And they, as the Lord blessed it, I was asked to put it uh, into a chapter of a book, and then I was asked to make it a book. Mm. Thus, Embers to a Flame uh, was uh, published and still is being used. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Yeah. So I, and I, uh, your church, Briarwood, has been a, a large, thriving church in Birmingham for many years now. Uh, I have not lived in Birmingham, as both of you have. I have been to Dreamland Barbecue, so at least I've, yeah. I've touched down well, there. Well, you've touched culture. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I've, I've, been, I've been by. Uh, but when you are here to talk about... Uh, at this conference at, at Kingdom Come 2023 at Coral Ridge, talking about uh, the sufficiency of Scripture. I think this applies to what you've been telling us about revitalization. W sufficient for what? I think that's helpful to clarify. What is the Scripture sufficient for? Well, it's sufficient for all matters of what we need to know about God, how to have a relationship with God, and how to serve God. It's not a book on mathematics. It's not a book on um, uh, on geography. Um, now, wherever it speaks to those matters, it's true. Right. But that's not what it's designed to do. It is a it is divine revelation of who God is as Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. How you know Him and how you make Him known. And all the matters that for godliness, everything you need to glorify God and enjoy him forever is in the word of God. And that then gives you a framework so that when you have claims to truth from common grace, you know, a mathematics book, a uh, science book or whatever, you put it through the prism of God's word so that you then begin to understand all of the claims that are being made. And um, so, th so, uh, so the the scriptures the 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 the, the, the text I u I'll be using here is of course the text that my Old Testament my systematic theology theology professor beat me to last night uh, is that um, that the scriptures inspired is profitable for doctrine uh, for teaching for uh, for reproof for correction and uh, righteousness that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. So all that I need to do good work, not to be saved, my works can't save me, but I can do good works to honor my Savior. The Word of God tells me how to know Him and make Him known to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. So that's why I said, you know, if Jesus has planted His church, a church that is in 
uh, a church that's in a downward spiral, that wouldn't take him by surprise. Mm -hmm. There's got to be something in the Bible to tell me about it. And that's how we found, and uh, you know, in the book of Acts, where Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and strengthen the churches. And then we see the clinic case of the church at Ephesus, two different times, was revitalized in the Bible. And thus, we download the principles so that pastors facing that, and right now, right now, 88 to 92 percent of the churches in North America are stagnant or declining. Mm. And uh, you're coming out of seminary. Guess where your call is going to be? Yeah, you, you've got a. Uh, you're not going to get called chance. to Coral Ridge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're going to get called to a declining, a church. declining church. So you better learn how to do this. Mm. That's why I'm grateful. Uh, Westminster Seminary, RTS, Birmingham Theological Seminary, all take our material on church revitalization, and they have created classes for their MDiv students to take it before they graduate. Wow. You're a graduate of Westminster Theological Seminary in right. Philadelphia you're on the board of trustees. I know you're a big Gresham Machen fan who was the founder of Westminster Theological Seminary and really represented old Princeton. I've often heard you talk about the battles he was facing, uh, liberalism and Christianity in America. What similarities do you find between the battles he was fighting regarding liberalism and the battles we're fighting today concerning progressive Christianity. Well, Rob, um, yeah, that's the key is to understand the battle we're fighting is progress. Uh, the progressive movement has two arms. There is the progressive secular movement uh, in, in terms of the culture, and there is the progressive Christian movement in terms of the evangelical church. They both have something in common. Uh, they, both, um, they both are aimed at deconstruction. Uh, the progressive secular movement, I mean, the, yeah, the progressive secular movement wants to deconstruct Western civilization or Christendom, as we have called it. And then, um, and then progressive Christianity wants to deconstruct the evangelical faith and redefine it. They, uh, progressive Christianity uses the same vocabulary but a different dictionary. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why it, it's so deceptive. I think Machen would have seen it. Uh, <laughs> let me put it this way. I hope I'm seeing it as Machen would have seen it. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that progressive Christianity is cut from the same bolt of cloth mm -hmm. as liberalism. Uh, his great book, uh, Christianity and Liberalism, made the point that liberal Christianity is no Christianity. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's the worst enemy because it, it uses the same terms but uses different meanings. But what I what at the core of it was when liberalism came at the end of the 19th, at the 19th century, moving into the 20th century, it came to the mainline Protestants and said, hey, we're here to save you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be thrown on the trash bin of history. The modern mind's not going to take this. So we won't. This is the Christian century. In order to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. So you got to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. So they then begin to not deconstruct. They just went outright. They were at least honest. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't believe this virgin birth stuff, inerrant Bible stuff, miracle stuff. Yep. I mean, you're, 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 you're going to lose the next generation. You have to attack the familiar. supernatural. Right. So yep. you vacuum out the supernatural mm -hmm. and change the confessions, and now we can move into the Christian century. Wow. But what they did was threw the mainline Protestant church on the dustbin of history because they changed the mission of the church from center transformation to cultural transformation. And whatever your mission is will eventually define your message. If you believe that the if you believe your mission is self-esteem, you're going to get a therapeutic gospel. Church growth, you're going to get a pragmatic gospel. Uh, prosperity, um, uh, success in life, you're going to get a prosperity gospel. So, uh, so what they did was the message, instead of being faithful to the Bible, biblical magisterium became cultural magisterium. Yep. 
to accommodate the culture. Well, now the same thing's happening to the evangelical church. Mm-hmm. Hey, you're going to lose the next generation. You need to rethink this. Now, we're not going to deny anything, but we need to deconstruct it. We need to redefine it. And, um, and again, it's cultural transformation. Listen, I'm all for cultural transformation. I'm in the public square debating public theology all the time. Mm-hmm. But cultural transformation is not the mission of the church. It's the consequence of the church being on mission because when people change lives change families change businesses change cities change and nations change amen amen, amen. and there's also a significant difference <clears throat> between transforming the culture and letting the culture transform us and that seems to be uh, this this common theme you look back to the you know the liberalist you know the modernist fundamentalist controversy and and machin and as you well described uh, you had this uh, really uh, the general Medicining of the supernatural in, in in the same language to try to make Christianity more palatable for its as it was called their cultured despisers, uh, and the 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 methods have not really changed, but the the arena the battleground has changed a little bit. In what ways now are is the church being tempted to compromise its message to uh, become quote unquote progressive in order to appeal to people? And, and I think there's probably some well-meaning people even who think, well, in the name of outreach, we need to sort of keep these things covered up and be accepting of these things. Where are the uh, where are the pressure points now for churches? Well, you know, the the fact is, yeah, you're right. There are wolves in sheep's clothing, but then there are sheep in wolves clothing. And so there are believers that have mm. just got sucked into it. Yeah. And uh, so you know, I want to rescue them and, and really encourage them. And I think they're well-meaning. I just think they're wrong-headed. Yes. And uh, so... Um, um, but yeah, well, you know, we're back to this cultural accommodation. You see, if I want to be, if I believe the church's call is to change the culture, then I want to seat at the table of the cultural elite, the culture shapers. Right now, there are five of them in our na- in our nation. Right now, the culture shapers today um, are um, are big business, uh, uh, big journalism, uh, big government. Uh, the entertainment industry, and big education. Mm -hmm. Those are the five culture shapers. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is, is we, the church, the pulpits are saying, well, listen, we'll, hey, we'll preach against what they want us to, but we'll be silent about what they tell us to not preach against. Oh, we'll still believe it. But we're not going to be public about it. So you'll hear our pulpits rightly preach against racism, Mm -hmm. rightly preach against, uh, um, rightly preach against um, injustices, rightly preaching human trafficking, human trafficking. But you're strangely silent on the sanctity of life, Mm -hmm. the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of gender, Mm -hmm. uh, the sanctity of family. Strangely silent on those things. Now we still believe it. And by the way, we're going to once we get them into the church, we'll begin to talk to them about it in the Sunday school class or the small group. But listen, here's what you got to understand. The gospel saves people from their sins. And you can't bring the good news until you bring the bad news. Mm-hmm. When My favorite story, one of them in evangelism, is the woman at the well. And Jesus very carefully but very clearly pointed out her sin. And then she goes into the city and she finds a man. That's her only audience, and it's a big audience, uh, given her past. And what does she tell them? She not only tells them about Jesus who gave her life and that saved her from her sins, she said this, come and meet the man who showed me everything I I ever did. did. What endeared her, what endeared him to her was he showed her her sin. Without that, she would never have come to a savior mm. uh, from her sins. And so um, that's that's what's missing today is we want a we want to bring people to Christ. Why? A better life, human flourishing. And but Jesus came to save us from our sins. You shall call his name Yeshua because he will save his people from their sins. And, you know, when, you, when it says in Acts 17, 6, that the, an adversary of the kingdom in Europe, less than 25 years after the ascension of Jesus, 
Less than 25 years in Europe, a pagan says, these people have turned the world upside down and they've come here also. Well, what they don't know is Paul didn't go out to turn the world upside down. That was the effect. Paul went out to turn sinners right side up. And when sinners get turned right side up, lives change, marriages change, families change, businesses change, citizenship changes, all of that changes because Christians have a very, very broad mission, salt of the earth, light of the world. But they can't do that unless the church stays on its narrow mission, make disciples with its comprehensive message, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Mm. Harry, you were my pastor while I attended Sanford University. I uh, had the privilege of sitting under your teaching and your shepherding at Briarwood Presbyterian Church. And it which... was a difficult job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, still, it's still underway in many ways, right? Uh, Briarwood Presbyterian, just in case our audience doesn't know, was the birthplace of the Presbyterian Church of America, has always played a significant role in our denomination, a denomination which, by the way, has, from its founding, had a high view of Scripture. Uh, Briarwood, in many ways, is still still a, a leader in our denomination, and you're a part of a group called the Gospel Reformation Network, in fact, on the executive council of the Gospel Reformation Network, which is concerned about promoting healthy churches in our denomination. Tell us a little bit about that network, why it's important, and why you're a part of it. Yeah, what happened is uh, when I was um, I had the privilege to serve as moderator of the General Assembly, and I preached my moderator's sermon, and I just dealt with the issue of the gospel, that the gospel is a has these two glorious promises, the declarative blessings of justification and adoption, and then the transformational blessings of regeneration and sanctification. And that in sanctification, uh, here is where it's 100% God and 100 Hundred percent us. We depend upon God, and we are devoted to killing sin and pursuing holiness. And there are two traps to always avoid: Le avoid legalism, which means I'm saved by my works and my obedience, or libertinism, I'm saved, so it doesn't matter whether I obey or not. Mm -hmm. And the Bible very clearly points out both ditches. Well, we were living in an era where they were preaching against legalism, but doing so promoting libertinism. And so we took that on, the Gospel Reformation. Now, after my sermon, I had elders coming everywhere. Pastor, uh, I, I think we're getting too much grace at our church. And... Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Pastor, I think we're getting too much grace in our church. And I said, no, no, that's not your problem. You're not getting enough grace. Hmm. You're getting the declarative blessings of grace. You're not getting the transformational blessings of grace. Hmm. And that's what you, well, you need more grace. <laughs> you need not only justifying grace, you need sanctifying grace. And uh, so... So we started the G GRN, and then when we began to see the movement of progressive Christianity into the PCA and v just coming through certain cracks and crevices and, and everything, we decided, hey, we what we had to deal with in sanctification, we now not only have to continue to deal with that, but now also regeneration, the, because the, the promise that you're no longer under the dominion of sin. Now, you still got remaining sin— but no longer under, you're under reigning sin. So the, the GRN is, uh, we're not a political movement. We are open, you know, sunshine, everything. Mm -hmm. But we have four things we try to do. We preach, uh, we publish, we pray, and we persuade. Mm -hmm. And we believe God is using us uh, very thankfully to some degree, but it's him that is doing it. And we're grateful for what we're seeing and the various concerns in the PCA as we meet this movement of progressive Christianity as Machen did and with liberal Christianity and say, no, not here. Uh, this church will remain by God's grace, faithful to the glory of God, exalting the son of God uh, through the word of God and the power of the spirit of God. Yeah. 
I think that the experiences uh, in the PCA in your denomination are instructive for all of us as well. You know, the the, the reformers uh, th- had the saying "semper reformanda," uh, always reforming, and they recognize that need for constant reformation. The the, the Presbyterian Church in America is what, uh, roughly fifty years old now uh, in that ballpark, and it was founded as really because of the corruption that was was taking place. Uh, in terms of, of doctrine and, and that, that progressive Christianity and the, the mainline denomination. And yet, here we are, uh, you, you still, you don't, just because, just because you uh, reform at one point doesn't mean that you're not going to face those struggles again down the road. Uh, how are they different now? What sorts of struggles uh, do, does the PCA face? And, and in what ways can that also be applied to those who are listening who are Southern Baptist Convention and who are even non denominational but, uh, you know, uh, the church has been going for a while. The, these kinds of challenges are sort of universal, aren't they? Good question. So Machen met with the leaders of the uh, what was then called the Southern Presbyterian Church, Presbyterian Church of the United States, um, before he died. And he told them, he said, guys, it's coming to you, too. He was in the Northern Presbyterian Church mm-hmm. when he fought the battles. And he said, it's coming to you. And you're just 30 years behind us. And he was right. So in 1973, when they were going to change the confession from the Bible is the Word of God, to the Bible contains the Word of God, uh, that's when we said, well, we fought a lot of battles, but we're leaving. And so the, the founding fathers came out of the Southern Church in order to, and I love our vision, I don't want it to ever change, to be true to the Scriptures, um, faithful uh, to the, re, uh, I'm sorry, to be to be uh, faithful to the Scriptures, to be true to the Reformed faith, and to fulfill the Great Commission. And that's what they said, this is what we're about, this is what we're going to do. And uh, so we began, 1973. I remember my first General Assembly was right here at Coral Ridge Presbyterian in 1981. Mm. And so so it began. Well, here we are 50 years later. And guess what? We're now having to fight not the inroads of liberal Christianity, but the inroads of progressive Christianity. But this shouldn't amaze us. If you'll go check your Bible, if you'll go check church history, every 40 to 80 years— Mm. institutions, movements, churches, all fight that battle. And you know, it seems like your first functional generation's excited, second generation, let's carry it on, third generation, we're going to reinvent it. <laughs> and, uh, and so it begins to go downhill. Just read the book of Judges every 40 to 80 years. So that's where we are. And most of our institutions. Um, so Coral Ridge Presbyterian, you've been there. And um, here you are now serving the Lord effectively. Hmm. Um, Briarwood, we've been there. Uh, RTS, been there. Westminster Seminary, we've been there. We're all in that in that area. And the and those institutions and churches and denominations that come through it, uh, still committed and still uh, serving the Lord and utterly dependent and devoted to him, dependent upon him and devoted to him. It comes back to leadership every single time. And so um, I thank the Lord for the leadership that God gave you through Rob here at Amen. Coral Ridge. I'm thankful to the Lord for the leadership at Westminster Seminary with Peter Lilbeck. I'm yes. thankful to the Lord for the leadership at uh, RTS with Ligon Duncan. I'm thankful to the Lord because it always comes back to leadership and very seldom singular leadership. God begins to surround that leader with other leaders. Uh, Luther wouldn't have been Luther without Melanchthon. Uh, um, Calvin wouldn't have been Calvin without Beza. Um, Knox wouldn't have been Knox without Without Goodman, uh, Cranmer wouldn't have been Cranmer without Latimer and Ridley. Mm. So those are all crucial. That plurality of leadership, and that's that's why I wrote the book 3D Leadership, is that we need to define, develop, and deploy leaders. Right now, the world is defining leadership. We're bringing them into the church, and we think six cl- six uh, officer training classes is going to turn them in, is going to turn a leader into a godly leader. No, it is a lifelong project. We need to define leadership, develop leaders, and then deploy leaders, not only in the church, but from the church into the world. Amen. Why is, particularly in the 21st century, as progressive Christianity is creeping into 
what has been historically known as uh, biblically faithful denominations and congregations. Why is it so important now for churches and pulpits to be teaching a biblical worldview concerning gender and sexual orientation? Well, everything's got a worldview. I mean, uh, I'm going to say in the talk here today, my kids, we would go to a movie. Uh, we'd be sitting watching a television program, and I'd, we'd leave the movie. I'd take them out to eat, and I'd say, okay, um, dollar bill if you get it right. What was that movie telling you? Tell me what it was telling you. Mm -hmm. There is no, there is no play. There is no book. There is no song. There is no, no production that hasn't a world in life view and a pedagogical reason for existing is trying to teach it to you. Absolutely everyone. And basically it's either theistic or atheistic. It's either focused upon God uh, and or it's not. Now, even if it's focused upon God, it may or may not be right. <laughs> but uh, but it, it, you got two two attempts: the secular or the quote unquote uh, theistic uh, world in life view. And we do the same thing with a commercial. What is it when they tell you have it your way? Do they really mean it? Of course not. <laughs> what they're doing is saying we're the people that make it all about you. It's yep. self worship Worship, yeah. self-absorption, yep. self-promotion. Mm -hmm. So, um, so worldview is something you do. As soon as you pick up the paper that says, "Oh, we've got bad weather," or "We've got good weather," they've just read the weather through a prism. So, if bad weather. It rained last night. Uh, well, the farmer, that was good weather. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, so what is so? How do you see things? And uh, that's why world and life view education is so important. Wow. Developing the Christian mind. Um, we are made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. We want to know why. Yeah. And we want to know what. And we don't know where did I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? Well, the Word of God frames a world in life view that answers those questions. That's good. And as we get ready to wrap up here as our, our time runs out, but I think that this is a closely related question to that. What do we as the church, what do we as pastors, what do we as parents need to be focusing on with our children and grandchildren in a, in a culture? It, it, the culture always tries to pull our kids away, but I think that they are facing an onslaught like we've never seen before uh, with social media and with the ubiquity of, of media of all kinds around them. What do we what do we need to be doing better and more of to 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 keep our children? Well, first of all, you got to have a right view of your children. Uh, they're born sinners. Mm -hmm. They're not going to sin and become sinners. They're sinners and they're going to sin. And it won't take you long to find out you've got a covenant viper in diapers right there. <laughs> Amen. Yep. But you've also got a promise. You don't parent to get a promise. You parent from a promise. I'll be a God to you and to your children after you. God has woven the family into his work of redemption. Uh, number three, he has given you his church. And the family needs to be in the church, and the church needs to be in the family. Don't you love it when it speaks of Mary and Joseph and, and Jesus speaking of being in the temple and in the synagogue, as was their custom? Mm -hmm. um, I am a big believer Sunday morning, Sunday night. I'm a big believer, small group during the week. I am a big believer. Right now, we, we, we all want these great godly heroes from the past. Well, you don't understand. They were great heroes from the past because they had the Word of God in them. Mm -hmm. yeah. George Will said, the reason democracy and doesn't work in these other nations and, uh, and, our, and our view of government doesn't work, he said, well, they don't have George Washington. They don't have Patrick Henry. Uh, they don't have John Adams. No, Mr. Will, you've missed it. The reason they don't have George Washington and John Adams is George Washington and John Adams came from families and a church. Yes. Mm. Finally, who is teaching your child? World and life view is being taught to your child. If that child, if your child is in a secular setting with a secular committed teacher, with all of the technology and all of the pedagogy, and they are teaching your child for eight hours a day, and you think 30-minute Sunday school class is going to undo that? Mm. You think um, you saying hello and going to the Little League game with them is going to undo that? Uh, you, when all Jesus said, when all said and done, the pupil becomes like the teacher. Who te what they're reading and who is teaching them is setting in their most formative years their world and life view. And so... Um, 
So you need to make, I'm not, the Bible does not tell me what venue to use to educate my child. It does tell me what to educate my child. When I rise up, I'm to be a model. I'm to take them into life, let them see. They learn by imitation. I am to teach them. They learn by mentoring, by instruction. And I need to make sure the people that are carrying on what I want to do are committed to what I'm committed to in teaching my child. I want my child to come to Christ. Christ, evangelism, number one, not teaching them how to be a Christian, teaching them to be a Christian. Otherwise, you're just raising a Pharisee. So bring them to Christ, a personal relationship, then teach them how do you think biblically, live biblically. You have a life view from the mind of Christ. You have a life love. The love of Christ compels you, and you have a lifestyle where you follow Christ. And that's what the parent does. And raise your child to leave you, Mm. not stay with you. Raise your child to leave you. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother. Right now, parents are too interested in their child being their friend. Mm. You got to give that up. They'll, they'll be your friend later if you'll be their daddy and mama now. That's a good word. It is. Dr. Harry Reeder, thank you so much for joining us on the City of God podcast. I know I speak for pastors all across our nation. We are grateful for your leadership, for your voice. But for me personally, thank you for your friendship. Oh, it's my privilege. And thank you all for this opportunity. Once again, our hearts go out to the Reader family and our brothers and sisters at Briarwood Presbyterian Church. You just got done listening and watching the podcast with Harry Reader, who is now uh, before the face of God in heaven. And uh, we will be doing everything possible, as we said in the introduction, to keep his legacy alive uh, in the church uh, for the sake of the kingdom of God. I want to thank you for listening to the City of God podcast, produced in partnership with the Institute for Faith and Culture. This is a weekly podcast, so be sure to listen to all previous podcasts at thecityofgodpodcast.com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts. Podcast, Spotify, or anywhere you listen to podcasts, and make sure that you check out the video version on our YouTube page. If this podcast was a blessing to you, uh, you want people to know uh, more about the life and ministry and the bold stance uh, that my brother and dear friend Harry Reader took in life and in ministry, please p- uh, pass on this podcast to family and friends. And I want to thank you once again for joining us on the City of God, and may God richly bless you until we're together. Again.